Hello and welcome to the fifth episode of Sales Ops Demystified. And on this very special episode, we've been joined by special guest, our official mascot called uh, called Bear. Uh. <laughs> Say hello to everybody. <laughs> There we are. Um, Cutest member of the team. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, we're also joined by Josh in the background. Hello, Josh. And most importantly, Kirsty. Thank you, you. If you've ever watched an episode before, you've probably heard about Kirsty, especially last week with Alex. Um, <laughs> Kirsty, last night, or, or every month, or every two weeks. Every month. Every mm-hmm. month, hold the sales ops. What's the, the name of the actual name of the meetup? London Sales Operations Meetup. London Sales Operations Meetup. Um, and how many members have you got now? Uh, 180. Now. 180. And mm-hmm. there was about 50 people there 50. last night. Mm-hmm. And it was a big one last night, wasn't it, guys? Yeah, it was really good. Standing room only by the end of Really? It. Yeah, yeah. What did you learn, Henry? Um, I learned about uh, RAG, so mm-hmm. red, amber, green mm-hmm. for, for tracking opportunities. Uh-huh. Um, it kind of gives, I think it gives a certain sentiment about opportunities and forecasting. I think it's a really effective way, as well as using opportunity stages, using those those very simple red, amber, green sure. lights on opportunities. Nice. So yeah, I'm, I think we're probably going to in, implement that into uh, Great. It's super interesting. Mm. And, and there was also um, Jay, uh, who used to work at IBM, now works at Doctify. That was seriously interesting, him hearing him talk about the differences between working at a massive company like IBM and working at a very small startup like mm-hmm. Doctify, the differences between the two is really tremendous. Sweet. Um, so I guess we'll do a little call to action before we even start. If I Google London Sales Operations Meetup, mm-hmm. will I go to the Meetup page? Yes. Okay, yes. cool. So if anybody's interested um, in London, I know you record the talks as well, though. Yeah, so. just the audio we do. Okay, mm-hmm. so if someone could, if they're in like New York, could still attend, well, say they're a member to the Meetup and mm-hmm. then get the audio afterwards. Yep, I always send it out to all the members after. Sweet. So if anybody is interested, Highly recommended from pretty much everyone we've had on the show. Um, some admin before we start. Any questions, Josh is on the chat. Uh, you may notice there might be a slightly crisper picture and audio because we've invested in some new equipment. Um, slides are down in the corner. Uh, again, the slides are not, there's not no real content on the slides, just some kind of bullet points that we're going to be chatting through. Um, we have now actually a standard eight to 10 questions that we're going to be asking every guest. Um, so you should see some continuity with episodes. So this, I think, we believe, uh, based on feedback, is going to give it more a more like engaging talk because we'll have the same questions every time, which we believe are the questions that people actually really care about. Um, any more admin points before we start? Nothing from me. Cool. Okay. So welcome, Kirsty. Um, and so I, I think what was quite interesting is that we asked Alex last week. Mm. And we had a great time with Alex. Alex is really, really good. Mm-hmm. And he'd already recommended you because you actually co-run the meetup. Yes. But then one of the questions we asked right at the end is, who is like a sales off ninja that you recommend that we speak to? And he yeah. said, you again. Did he? Yeah. Oh, it's very kind you of have him. to speak to Kirsty. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm really excited about the talk. Um, I'm probably going to hand over to Henry to, to kick things off. Well, I think maybe talk about how you... Yeah, I think, I think maybe Kirsty just needs to introduce herself. Exactly what, what exactly what your role is, mm-hmm. what company you work for, um, what you kind of do day to day. Yeah, so um, I I'm head of sales operations at a scale up company called uh, Signal. When I joined about nine months ago, it was kind of reaching the end of the kind of the startup phase. So it's been a bit of a transition. We've doubled our team in six months. In terms nice. of yeah, the company's now at about 100. 30 people, it was 60 when I started, so a lot of growth, and yeah. a lot of that, in fact, most of that's come from the commercial team, so uh, hiring sales reps and SDRs yeah, and that's management really, that needs to come with it. Really interesting. Mm-hmm. That's impressive. Yeah. And so yeah. How, how many sales people? So there? we now have 37, I believe, globally, so in that time we've opened uh, an office in New York as well, and we've also got a feet on the ground in Asia now as well. And you're a head of sales operations, so you're responsible yes. for sales operations. Yes, yeah. so I started off as manager, um, yeah. but now because it was just me and it was a new role mm. for the company um but now we've grown the team to currently three but we're hiring two more people sure. and in terms of the management that that 37 sales people is that just reps or does that include the management team or the sales team as well what that i work with yeah yes yeah, so i report directly into the cro cool. who our vp of sales also reports into interesting nice yeah. I, i'd be interested to talk to you about how you how you manage people at a distance how, how you 
get the best out yeah, of it. Yeah, it with difficulty really. Um we obviously we use Slack a lot, which is really useful. Yeah, yeah. Um but when what's what's really challenging in the situation is there's five new sales reps over there, all completely new to Signal, and there's no one leading mm. them that's yeah, well. been worked at Signal because our president over there is new as well. Sure. So we're really trying to give them as much uh, love and attention. We brought them over here for our kickoff in January um, originally. So they all came over, spent two weeks here yeah. um, and did loads of onboarding, spent loads of time with like, the product team, the marketing team. Um, Understand the culture of the business. Exactly, yeah. And our CEO actually went over a few weeks ago and he met the people that we've hired since that kickoff. The difference in kind of who they, like the culture of the company, how they fit in, like if they had a problem knowing who to go to to get the answer, sure, yeah. was so, cul- um, so culpable that from now on, every hire we make in America, we're going to bring them over to London for two weeks Makes just for them to make those connections mm-hmm. and get absorbed in the culture as well. I think it's the best thing to do. Mm-hmm. I know that obviously Salesforce do that with all their new recruits. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, they need seven, and I'm pretty sure they all go to San Francisco for at least a week's onboarding. Nice. I think Conga do it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of makes sense. Mm-hmm. It gets people all on the same wavelength. Yeah. And it's an investment in your stuff. Well. Yeah. Yeah. It shows them an investment. Mm-hmm. It gets them onboarded a lot quicker. Yeah, absolutely. So how did you get into sales operations? So, well, I've learned over my meetup, actually, that there doesn't seem to be, the kind of traditional route, I guess, is starting as like a Salesforce administrator mm-hmm. and being promoted up. But I came from a very, very different background. So I did applied science at university and ended up as a chemist in um, mm-hmm. GlaxoSmithKline. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I was analysing um, finished goods and kind of signing them off for um, what sale to anything intravenous yeah, through my Finished goods as in from Finland? No, no from as Finland. in um, manufactured goods. Okay, right. As in anything that was injected intravenously came because we had 17 yeah. different products we were testing all the time. That is vastly different to what you do now. Well, well no, yeah. I, was, I actually also studied chemistry. Mm. Um, Did you? And <laughs> uh, you have to be very analytical. Exactly. Which I think is what we're going to get into. Exactly. So I actually almost feel like all roads have kind of led to this, actually. Yeah. And I've, I've definitely now have like found my career. But so I started at GlaxoSmithKline, mm. and then I was offered um, a place on a graduate scheme in London. Mm. So I deferred in, for in a year. In science or in? No, in research. Mm. So I deferred it for a year and then came down to London to start on the graduate scheme. Um, which was working in quantitative research. So actually a lot of parallels again. And I was basically, it was, um, we have a big database and I was working with various brands and it was all shopper uh, data. Mm -hmm. So we were looking at that huge database and pulling stories and like working out why certain brands were growing, why other brands weren't, what kind of strategy could they use Mm -hmm. to to further grow their brand. Um, So again, very similar, it's kind of just analytical research science. Um, And so I stayed in, in research for a while and then, um, I'd always been really interested in, well, I originally thought sales would be the worst job in the world. And I said many times I would never work in sales. Mm. Um, and then actually working in a more commercial environment was quite interested in it. So I moved into the sales team as a consultant mm. for the software that we were selling um, and was very involved in pitching, um, like kind of redesigned the proposal deck. I was like very involved with all of the big, bigger value deals. It was basically like a pre-sales role. Yeah. Um, so I got a lot of exposure to the sales um, side there and then my friend basically got a job at Signal and mentioned about the sales op- mm-hmm. uh, role that was going so this was my first sales ops role. And so that was nine months ago? Yeah, May the 1st I started here. Do you think it's been a steep learning curve or do you think yeah. you already had the skills necessary so it was kind of kind of straightforward? I think yeah a bit of both really because learning uh, I've always worked for massive companies until I started working here so making the, the right. shift to a startup was incredibly different you can imagine um yeah and and it but it's also like vastly more exciting in in my opinion because we're not chasing a kind of two three percent growth we're chasing 100 percent growth all the time Mm -hmm. so and 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 also with it being a new role being able to make one change you can immediately see the impact yeah Um, i suppose last night jay was talking about working in ibm mm -hmm. how it was extremely structured everything was extremely structured Mm -hmm. and worked a certain frame uh, framework and I suppose you, you were the one defining the framework at Signal. Yes, Yeah. exactly. Really fun. Mm, and I think because it's a smaller team as well, I know that previous companies where I've worked in the final sales operations role, it's been a hugely like reporting, basically running numbers, being a kind of admin role, really. Um, but here, because it's so new and it's all exciting, and, and it's not just new to me, it's new to my manager at the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we kind of grew and just we just identified what needed doing, and that was a priority, really. Mm. Um, and so the next question on the list is about what you think makes an awesome sales person. I think mm. we've kind of touched on that already. 
if you'd like to elaborate. Yes, I think I think from from my experience anyway, obviously like attention to detail, you know, that you need that to be a sales operations person. But I think um specifically talking from a startup perspective, you just need to be willing to get stuck in with everything because um, I was laughing the other day. Um, so what, like, on the one hand, I was like helping define the strategy for our American office, mm. and then the next minute, I was like pulling two reps apart that were squabbling about who should get which lead. You know? So it's just oh. such a, um, a variety of like levels of, of, of projects, and sometimes it's just really in the weeds, and sometimes it's really high level, which is what keeps it really interesting. Who got the lead in the end? <laughs> well, the right Jeff, person. The right person yeah. We well. use data to decide that. Exactly. And you're, in your very strict processes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Foolproof every time, exactly. of course. There's no like fringe cases. No, 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 no grey areas. No. <laughs> um, so, yeah, willingness to get stuck in, I think, mm. and also organisational, because I think sales ops can very easily become a jumping ground. Um, mm. I think you know, if, to what makes a good sales ops person in my mind is someone who gets stuff done, mm. which sometimes means that you just become that go-to person. Mm. So you know, if something needs doing, curse you'll get it done. And sometimes right. you have to be you have to be aware of like, be willing to get stuck in, but be aware of what's actually going to add value and move the needle, uh, and isn't just kind of, mm. Do you yeah. um, do you document all the work that you all the changes that you carry out? A no. bit like a platform, like a CRM platform owner, they're meant to document everything they do. So mm. if if they was get hit by a bus, people can come in and understand what's been done. Yeah. Um. So we we try to use Trello a bit for that in terms of like projects that have currently been worked on that completed, what's been marked and parked. Um. I did start when I first started here. I did try. I did used to keep record of things like that. But then just you can imagine. Too much. Yeah. 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 Uh, so a, re- a big question that I find fascinating, actually, that we bring up every time mm. is the point about needing sales experience. Mm. So you didn't. Like, Not. I didn't have a number. No, I was working very closely with sales reps in in the previous role. Mm. Okay. Cool. But um, do you think it's necessary? Sales experience. Mm. I don't think so because you should be working so closely with the head of sales and you I think it helps obviously because you can be more sympathetic to their workflows mm. what's likely to work what's likely to be rejected what's likely to be adopted if you're if you're more sympathetic to their to their world but I think what's been really key to my role is I've always worked so closely with the head of sales and obviously that's they're experts at that so mm. you should be giving each other advice and sounding ideas off each other anyway in yeah. my opinion yeah, so you need to be experts in your field you're an expert in operations of sales, exactly. they're, they're an expert in sales. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Being really good at particular subjects. <laughs> and quite, I mean, yeah, very often sense. what makes you a very good sales rep would not make you a very good yeah, manager or, you know, yeah, yeah. A, a team player. So what's so. one characteristic, sorry to put you on the spot, that you need to be good at sales, you need to have to be good at sales, that mm. wouldn't necessarily help you in sales operations? Uh, I mean, it sounds negative, but we always say you have to, the best sales reps are quite inherently selfish because they're just so focused on their number and getting mm. to that number yeah. that it makes them not a team player. So to move from just being focused on your number, mm. I mean, sales is a team sport, we all get that, but the single-minded people who will do anything to hit their target at the end of the month or quarter, um, moving from that role into a role where actually it's other people that are accountable for your number mm. and, yeah. and you're, it's a team purely a team is yeah. such a hardship so how, how can you how can you train how can you get the right characteristics for salespeople? because are you are you do you help interview salespeople on the way in? yeah yeah so mm-hmm. how do you get the right characteristics in a salesperson that means they are a team player and they obviously can hit their number at the end of the quarter yeah i think it's about focus and prioritization is it it's always about moving the needle i guess okay. at the end of the day just being aware of that um, but also someone that's got an, it, 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 if you've got one rep smashing it and then 16 yeah. not, then obviously that's, that's terrible. So you need to have someone that's willing to help. Yeah. Um, you need to have a mix of people in the sales team, don't you? Sure, yeah. And how do you, how do you analyze the activities of, I, I can, we could talk about this all night, but how do you analyze the activities of someone who's a very good sales rep and actually try and get those the things they're doing onto the, the less good sales rep? What do you, what, how do you do that? It's a great question, actually. We're trying to do that at the moment. We're trying to work out what is, what, for example, what's our best cadence? What's our best like touch points, activity mm-hmm. ratios? Do we just need to hit, hit the co- the phone all day? Should we be supplementing yeah. that with you know emails and SMS or something that we got demoed today? Mm. Um, is that I, an SMS from Salesforce? Just... Um, it's actually we were had a demo with a tool called Groove, and it's oh, all yeah. built into their yeah, cadence okay. program. Mm-hmm. Then you, can, you can create games in groups, they'll go email, phone, well, remind you to phone. Mm. But it can actually even add them on LinkedIn for you. It can like oh, automatically add them. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Sounds great. It was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah, we were quite impressed by it, actually. Yeah, nice. 
Um, mm. That actually leads nicely on to our next question. Mm. Yeah, right. yeah, so what's your, what's your current tech stack for sales? So we are reviewing it at the moment. We have a lot of tools. Um, obviously, Salesforce. Yeah. Um, but then we have a really good tool uh, called Insight Squared, which yeah. sits on top of our Salesforce, and that visualizes everything in pretty much in real time. So that's actually where our CEO lives now. Um, okay. He doesn't actually go into, he doesn't even have a login for our Salesforce anymore. Can he not have the dashboard in Salesforce? Uh, yes, but I think that he prefers Insight Squared because you can dig. You've got your chart on Insight Squared, which is you know you've got a dashboard. It's got all the correct filters on because I'm sure it's like any Salesforce. If you forget to put a certain type of filter on, or oh, to filter it not to CS and just to sales, yeah. you can end up with 16 different numbers for the yeah. same metric. So yeah. um, everything in Insight Squared, we know if, you, if you're going from the dashboard, it's got all the correct filters on. Nice. So you can click into the chart, and then you can add lots of filters. You can change your time zones. You can you know, click into certain deals, you can get right into all of that mm. detail right in Insight Squared. So it's a really good tool for kind of just digging through the data and visualizing it all really clearly. Nice, big mm. up to Insight Squared. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah drop them in there. <laughs> um, so we use Insight Squared for the visualization, which is a great manage management tool. Mm. Um, we also use Sales Loft, so from our yeah, prospecting. Yeah. Uh -huh. And then uh, we use um, GOM, which is a call recording software powered by AI which is great, um, but we're not getting full value from it at the moment. So that connect for, you can analyze voice. Yeah, so it, it integrates with your calendar. So mm. every call that's in your calendar, it's got a screen share link mm. into it. It'll just automatically join and it records the screen and the audio. Mm. And at the end of every call, you get um, an email and it analyzes you against that because they've got thousands and thousands of data points, well, mm. millions of data points. And it tells you where you are against best practice. So like, did you ask enough questions? Did the conversation flip enough? You spent too long talking on this particular topic, for example. Because I, I, I used to work in, the, in, that, in that kind of space. Mm. And it, the problem with voice recording and transcription and analysis mm. that, is that sometimes you have to have a machine do all the listening for you and give you some results that mm. you can do, because otherwise there's just too much information. You can't listen back to calls to, to see how good they mm. were. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's a waste of time. Yeah. You, need, you need a machine to do it for you. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives them recommendations as well. So we had bad words um, yeah. programmed in. So things like sort of, um, mm -hmm. mic, um, uh, you know, all of those kind of yeah. bad filler words. And we have a rep who has done some kind of sales and movement before. And she's always said to all the reps that she's trained, you can never, ever sit on the fence. If someone asks you how much something costs, you have to have conviction in what you're saying, mm -hmm. because yeah. otherwise, you know, the, the, the prospect's never going to trust you. Yeah. Licking no. my feet. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, um, and she got her first gone call recording emailed out to her. Uh -huh. And she'd, in a 20 minute call, she'd said sort of 17 times. Uh -huh. And she was horrified. And then the next call that she did, she said it twice, cause, just because she was more aware. Yeah. And that's all automated coaching. So that's not her manager having to sit and listen to the call and give her feedback yeah. on it. It's all done automatically. Does, does that tie into Salesforce as well? So can you see that against? Uh, the lead or the opportunity, whatever, whatever stage it's at. The actual, uh, so it feeds, it links to Salesforce in that. Um, what's really nice is if you're ever searching for calls, so I want to listen to, um, for example, when a new rep starts and I yeah. want to give them call recordings, um, every recording is time stamped with everything from Salesforce. Okay. So I could look for a call that was at um, a trial kickoff stage, for example, has now gone on to closed one and has a value of over, I don't know, like £20,000 associated right. with it. And it was by a certain rep or in a certain industry. You can apply any filter that you've got in Salesforce, you can right. apply, That's cool. which is really useful. Yeah, really useful. Mm. Anything, any, other, any other technology? Um, other technologies. So we have, we're looking to bring in a dialer because yeah. GOM can only integrate with soft phones, not hard phones. Sure, yeah. Um, What's the difference between a soft and a hard phone? Well, hard phone is mm. a physical phone. Mm. Uh, soft is like a desktop. Soft phone is yeah. like, a, like a, it could be a web phone or a, Mm -hmm. nice. LinkedIn Sales Navigator, obviously, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, we use like join.me for our screen share, um, we use DocuSign, sure, yeah. we've now baked that right into our process, so from Salesforce you just click to generate the order form, it's all done yeah. automatically and then you can send it through um, DocuSign. Yeah, so you've got well, you, you, so you click better. a button and it'll ping out the order form. Mm -hmm. yeah. On the opportunity, so if you're in the opportunity, Sick. yeah, just hit the button. And as long as all the addresses and everything are correct, yeah. it flags anything that's not correct. Um, and then I, it comes to me, I approve it, finance nice. approves it, and then they can, the rep can just send it out. Yeah, yeah. super effective. Uh, mm. Conver also do products similar to that. Uh -huh. 
Mm. It works. It just made the whole process like so much more streamlined than it used to be. You know, with Word docs yeah, getting edited yeah, yeah, yeah. and <laughs> yeah, you also got full audit control as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. um, and what's your favourite? Um, of everything that you use, I'd maybe say Gong, just because of the, uh, the added value that it can bring. Um, but we we're very aware because one of the things you can do in it, for example, is build a library. And we just never done it. It was never given it the time it really deserves. So we're going to get this dialer in and then yep. do a full relaunch um, of it internally to make sure everyone's using it and everyone's getting value from it. Um, and then do the, yeah, have it all kind of in the process. Because a sales rep, a brand new sales rep can walk in and actually benefit from that day one. Yeah. So we could say like, here's a 30 second um, snippet, which is us doing some great objection handling, put that in that folder. Here's a great demo. Here's some great mm. negotiation discussions. Um, and the other thing that Gong can do actually, which is really cool, is because it recognises all the words, we can set up various trackers. Mm -hmm. So we've got our common objections set up as trackers, and every call that that objection is brought up in, yeah. it pings an email to the product team. That so they get an alert, so they can see, right, and it helps us build business cases because it also charts it over time. So we can say, um, over time, look, it, X percent of calls, they keep mentioning this particular feature that we don't have. We know it's on the roadmap, but you know, this is how many people are asking us about it. And then we can link it to obviously what's been closed last. That is very intelligent. Mm. And I take it, so uh, for going to work, this is a bit technical, but mm. you have to have stereo sound. Would it be, left? you know, when you talk about left and right in the mm. stereo, one side would be the prospect and one side would be the, the user. Mm. Uh, I take it, you can't do it in mono, can you? Because you can't split out the voice file, I think. So um, if you've got phone systems that are delivering in stereo, I think mm. you could use Gong. I think that's ultimately. Right, I'm not sure. Mm. But I do know that it manages to pick up who's talking. Obviously, for a shared line, it's very obvious. It just knows who's, because it does it through join.me. Um, but our dialer, it also integrates with, and it knows, because it shows you a little picture, like where the conversation flips and who's talking when. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure about the very stereo cool. one or thing. Though. Very cool. So we have another question. Mm. Do we have any questions on online yet? You continue on. Take a look. Another tool actually that I was going to mention is, which is a really simple one, it's not really a sales ops one, but obviously in sales ops you end up organising quite a lot of events and we mm. always like to try and get a few knees up in the uh, calendar. And um, I thought everyone used a Doodle. Have you used Doodle before? No, oh, because I, I started using it to organise our, we're having a team at night out tomorrow. Um, so it's a free tool. Mm -hmm. You just go to doodle.com, I think it is. And you just put in the dates mm -hmm. that you could do it and then you just send it to anyone you want and they come in and tick which dates they can do. And they can uh, say, like, could do it a push and put it as orange instead of green. And it makes it so easy to organize events outside of work time. Mm -hmm. I, I really mean, recommend that. I think the, the, tech, the tech team in our business, um, they were doing some quizzes with the entire team, the entire mm -hmm. business, about products. And I think there were like 30 questions on the quiz. Mm -hmm. um, and the, I can't remember the name of it. <laughs> it's an amazing piece of technology. Right. Great. We'll talk about it next week. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tune um, in next week. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do have a question actually uh, related to the the skip bringing on all these salespeople. Mm. Your onboarding process. So, what are like a couple of things that you've done that have been really effective with that onboarding process for these salespeople? Good question, actually, because um, that was one of my first projects was reducing the ramping time because uh -huh. we were we were hiring people and finding that some of them were it was taking like six to nine months before they made their first sale. Well, um, which is when it's not a huge enterprise deal, and mm -hmm. that average lead, uh, our average deal length is about three months, isn't great. Mm -hmm. um, so we took um, a really close look at it, and I brought in a, an onboarding program as a company. We're back because we've hired so many people as a company. We've actually mm -hmm. brought in a fortnightly cadence, and every two weeks, for example, I run a sales onboarding session for anyone that started oh, in the really last two weeks. Nice. So marketing do one, like the different product teams do oh. one, all of the success teams do one. Every every weeks. single new employee yeah. gets put through that two week cadence. Nice. So that's all of the company onboarding. And what we do is we supplement that with sales onboarding. Mm. So we try and split it like morning and afternoon. So the first two to three weeks that someone's at Signal in the sales team anyway. They have their morning and afternoon training sessions every nice. day every and it's day. on a different topic. Yeah, so we now have a set. Uh, plan mm -hmm. and then we have a buddy scheme so just for the onboarding um, period of three months probation or you know it might be ex extended um, they have a buddy and they have to have a weekly hour go out for a coffee nice. chat even if you think there's nothing to bring up still go out because mm -hmm. something will come up and that's it's not to train them or to manage them it's just purely to answer questions around the culture 
you know, our, our head of engineering uses an example that uh, we have a 10 o'clock standoff in the engineering team. And in a lot of companies, apparently it's not very compulsory, you can turn up a bit late. But for our a VP of engineering, that is a really important meeting. If you're not going to be there for 10, you need to tell them that you're going to be late or tell someone so that they know where you are. And that's just a cultural thing. So that's the kind of thing that you would learn from your buddy. Nice. Uh, so we have the buddy scheme. And then I've actually introduced tests, which just creates <laughs> a little bit of urgency. Yeah. So um, I guess quite normal. You have like a demo test. So mm -hmm. before your reps start doing discovery calls uh, or demos, we have a discovery call test and we have a demo test. And I'll just pick a LinkedIn profile of someone in their territory so it's, that's, that could be a prospect and then they go and do the research, run the discovery call with us or with one of the reps. That gets passed, they use what they learned in the discovery call for the demo and then they do the demo test. Um, and then the final test that we do is, and you have to pass all three of these to pass your probation, is a written test all about like our product and our competitors nice. and why, why our personas find particular um, features like added value. Yeah. And that's yeah, something that everyone in the company ended up doing. Sounds pretty comprehensive. Yeah. So it's similar to what uh, Justin does. Uh, With his. Uh, Merrill, yeah. Well, they do tests. Yeah, they, they have a test process. Nice. And, and I think there's only two, two stages. Mm. I'll probably correct. <laughs> but yeah, it sounds, uh, yeah, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely worth doing. Mm -hmm. And the, well, the proof's in the pudding because we had our, one of our reps uh, signed a deal in the second month last month. That's really no. Good. Yeah. Really good. <laughs> and that's not everyone. But. <laughs> so he didn't inherit it from. No, he didn't. It was it was he'd prospected it himself, so really he did really well. Yeah, very impressive. Mm -hmm. So, um, how do you deal with data quality, and how does your role cross over with the CRM owner? Mm. So again, yeah, we do. So the our um, kind of head head of CRM kind of uh, role that sits underneath me now. Mm -hmm. oh, nice. um, yeah, so he used to sit in the marketing team, which didn't. It just meant that he was the gatekeeper for the CRM, which is crazy when it's a Salesforce tool. Yeah. So he's moved into our team now and we work really closely. And obviously, because of my background as well, I'm not a Salesforce admin person. So I really need someone in my team mm -hmm. who is an expert in that and can be the sure. gatekeeper. So we work really closely together. It's generally me, it's working out anyway, that it's kind of tends to be me having ideas and then he tells me how we can get there kind of thing. <laughs> and keeps me like grounded and says no that's that won't work because of x or y isn't it isn't it a salesforce admin meant to ask why exactly three or three times yeah, yeah. he's you, very you, good you, at that you can yeah. give an answer for you know each time mm -hmm. they might consider your <laughs> yeah once you've got three field, tickets yeah, yeah. <laughs> he doesn't maybe do tickets anymore but <laughs> yeah, so quickly jump in we have a question about recommended sales enablement tools we mentioned Sales loft. Mm. Um, mm. Yeah. So I guess the question is, would you recommend, or are there any others that you know? Um, in terms of tools, how do we really use one? We're, we're actually hiring a sales enablement person, so we're going to bring oh, someone right. in to do that. And I think someone with experience in our buyers is going to be really key. So knowing, understanding the world of our buyers and understanding our product positioning. Sure. Um, yeah, we, I don't use any particular tools. So, and how do you deal with data quality in the organization? Mm. Yeah, so that's a big project. So we've, we've actually got a p quite a poor quality at the moment. We've, we've kind of ha bought data from various sources over the years. Yeah. We've got a lot of duplicates in there. Um, so we're trying to kind of explore two options. One is like the kind of tech answer to it. So yeah. we're, we're currently looking at various different data providers that we just want to have a proper relationship with, but, but that really integrate with our sales, sales force. Yeah, yeah. So we can, as we go, we can clean up the data. Um, Secondly, we've actually made another hire. So we've got, it's almost like a data, a uh, very entry level role. Mm -hmm. And he, data analyst role. yes, like I said, we've called it Salesforce Analyst, but he's basically, he's coming in purely just to clean our data, input data, make right. sure the reps have all got enough data, just because it's got to that point where it's it's slowing down our productivity and it's, sure, it's creating yeah, quite yeah. a lot of friction, yeah. especially with our new office in America. You can imagine they're, they're all starting from scratch. Yeah. Um, so we thought it was, we're just kind of throwing everything at it really to try and get it started as quickly as possible. So he's in, Exploring different technologies, um, we're reviewing around eight tools or something at the moment. We've had reps trialing it. It's been it's been quite a, a coordinating task, um, but we've got a couple shortlisted that we're pretty confident. In. But our, our key requirement of those providers is that it has to integrate. It has to have a, like everything needs to be in Salesforce. That needs to be our yeah. point of truth. I think Jody last night was talking about getting reps back into Salesforce. Yeah. And don't have too many tools to try and get them focused because Salesforce mm -hmm. can offer a lot. Mm -hmm. and sometimes plugging another tool in isn't the answer. Yes, yeah. exactly. So it's a bit true. Mm -hmm. We do have an interesting question. I'm not sure if it's relevant for Salesforce, mm -hmm. or maybe sales management, but how mm -hmm. long do you test a new sales strategy before you stop doing it? If it's not working, 
I'm not sure if that's relevant. If not, yeah. Um, well, I, actually, I have, I have a little bit of an opinion on it because um, from my previous manager uh, in my previous job, and he was our VP of sales and marketing, and he always said managing a sales team is like managing a football team, and there are so many parallels. Mm. Like He would use it all the time as an analogy. Oh, that's so true. That makes sense. And he would always say, just stick to your strategy. Like, mm. Don't knee jerk right give it a quarter and it's not worked and change it you know just use data mm. to see why maybe it's not working can you tweak it um, and i'm not saying if it's you know, you know terrible and it's collapsing on its knees and you should you know, firmly stick with it don't change mm. it um but yeah he's you know there's not many quick wins in strategy it needs to be it's more like a shift that you, you guide isn't it so you need to be consistent Mm -hmm. over a period of time and try and tweak within the strategy exactly. before yeah. completely. Iterative, yeah, learn learn as you go. Okay. Mm. And so what do you think the biggest challenge in your role is? So pers personally for me, it's, it's I mean, we have problems with the data. We have problems with um, finding, you know, GDPR, finding contacts, yeah. making, like, trying to make the, the reps days more streamlined and get them selling as much as possible instead of researching and doing admin and managing trials. All of those things are issues. You know, we'd love to have a pre-sales role here. But personally for me, it is just meetings and juggling. Mm. I'm in like five to six hours of meetings a, a day. Really? Yeah. And you've got so, to work. Yeah, and now I manage people as well. Yeah, and sure. So yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty much about prioritizing. Um, but I think, you know, what I think what really helps is just always and, and this is how we've, we've structured our team we're all now tied to the revenue number mm. so everything is just our job is to make our, obviously the process more efficient have the best process in yeah. place but ultimately it's about hitting those quality and annual targets and having a strategy for next year so um always keeping focus on is this moving the needle is it adding value and is it or is it removing friction and do you think do you think tying sales ops to the to the number for the team do you think that's that's the that's the way it should be structured do you think yeah. you should I do, and I think especially if you've got, I mean, if you as an individual individual contributor, if you get given a checklist of things to do to get to your bonus, yeah, you could smash all of those things. But yeah. has any of it quite landed? Has it been implemented properly? Have the reps adopted it? Um, that's the most yeah, important that's bit. So yeah. So um, I think um, Jay said the same thing last night. Yeah, he was exactly, always yeah, glad to hear it. Actually, that's how his team's always been structured as well. And how do you, this is a, this is a different, this is just a question out of my head. Mm. How do you test the effectiveness of when you put in a piece of technology, how do you actually prove its value in the business? Is it, is it super clear once you've installed it and a month later, they're seeing value from it? How do you actually track how effective a new business technology is? Um, well, we, we actually sometimes bring things into Salesforce. So as soon as we got LinkedIn Sales Navigator, yeah. that was quite a hard win for me internally to, to get across the line. So Because it's expensive? Yeah, because yeah. it was the price. And I, I really wanted to bring it in for all of the reps, but um, we just didn't have the budget for that originally. So I brought it in just for the SDRs mm. and then added, obviously, with lead source drop down. So every time someone got contact from uh, Sales Nav in Salesforce, mm. they indicated it. So that made it really easy for me to go to the... FD and say look at all of these extra contacts we've got and just show how effective it was and also you get usage stats sure, from yeah. LinkedIn sales now so it made it quite easy for me and then like two months later we were allowed to bring it in for the whole team right so I always try to volume, yeah. yeah I think data is always like our company is very data driven our CEO is very data driven obviously yeah. our FD is um so yeah as long as you've got data to back up because you're a data business effectively aren't you mm, yeah you, you are sure. a data business yourself mm -hmm. so you appreciate the value of it Mm. I guess. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. So your biggest challenge. So you, what, what is your biggest challenge? End users know it's the prioritization. The, the prioritization mm. of of, all, of your time. Mm. And yeah. So yeah. just being really regimented and organized. That's how you. Yeah. That's how you exactly. That. Just prioritize and keeping on top of what's important, what isn't. Yeah. Um, I'd say the other key challenge that we have at the moment is hiring the right people mm. and the right. Uh, and then that's quite common. One isn't yeah, it? Just common. yeah and. But that the onboarding process as well has helped us to identify. I mean, it sounds quite brutal, but if something if if someone's not quite right for the role, we can identify that so much easier now, mm. and and actually in either work with them to try and work out where the where the problem is, or you know help them find another yeah. option. Um, not get rid of them. Help. Them yeah. Help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, do you have a single metric that you judge sales users by? Yeah, I actually I. I go on forecasting accuracy okay. um, because to me that shows deal control mm -hmm. and and deal management and yeah. relationship management. If if a deal if you if you can accurately say when a deal is going to come in, yeah, 
then it, even if it's even if it means you're going to fall short of your target, instead of having happy years and just over forecasting, which a lot mm. of reps can do, and you know, I guess when you if you haven't got a huge amount of pipeline, then sometimes there is pressure to forecast you know things a bit earlier than they should but I think reps that can generally get within 10 percent of where they forecast at the start of the month that shows to me that they're probably doing and it also means that um in terms of knowing where to focus their time so mm -hmm. reps that can visualize their funnel and be like right I need to focus on top of the funnel this month because in three months time I'm not going to have any pipeline sure, um sense. and just having that control of moving the, the stage the deals through the stages and being able to accurately predict when they come in to me shows and also awareness of, of um, as I, uh, Jordy said, around the red, amber, green. Yeah, yeah. Um, not chasing deals that aren't going to come in. Like having mm -hmm. some awareness of when a deal isn't isn't the right fit for us or the customer, and getting that out of the pipeline early on. I was thinking earlier today about the red, amber, green. The I think I think that is a I think that actually allows a salesperson to use their gut sometimes mm -hmm. on a deal. They mm -hmm. can actually just because every salesperson has a gut and they can get a, they they can truly understand if the deal's going to come in, mm -hmm. and their gut tells them. Um, that you've always got to leave some of that down to a salesperson. And I think the red amber green allows a sales user to be able to put that into a system to mm. be able to say this is at that stage mm. and not just rely on the uh, opportunity stages. Yeah, it's kind of That's adding really, like a qual qualitative yeah. layer on the quantitative stages. Yeah. yeah. Really interesting. Mm. Do, so, you, do you actually, and you do fully use that across all the opportunities? We do now, yeah. So yeah. it's even in Insight, Insight Squared, for example, it pulls everything from Salesforce and it'll mm. say, like, here's your green mm. forecast. Um, and then basically amber is your kind of upside for the month. That's so good. Mm. So every month you look at forecasting accuracy for every rep? Yes. And you're like, and you'd speak to them if they were consistently... Yeah, I speak to them, but also it means that you, you can, you know, if some if they give you a number of 100 grand for the month, yeah. you know whether it's going to be high. Because some reps do the opposite and they will not commit anything. And yeah, then, like yeah. So we had a, a deal that closed last week. And until the day it closed, mm. it was forecasted for the end of May. Yeah, really? <laughs> Just because of the what, pipeline visibility. Yeah. So obviously by tracking that. Why you can, would a rep not, not want to do that? Um, under promise, over deliver. Okay. It's better than yeah, over promising yeah. and under delivery. Yeah. Nice. Which is kind of true, but you can't have the whole team doing that, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Just yeah, just destroys that reason. Um, where are we on the question? We are. On the okay. Side. Yeah. 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 Um, so, if you had to take any sales operations person to lunch, <laughs> if I had to, <laughs> in London, yeah, who, who would it be? I feel like I have to say Alex now, don't I? He said me. No, 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 no you don't. <laughs> um, so I, I actually, uh, I've been really lucky. So um, purely by chance, when I was interviewing at uh, Signal, um, I think it was the day that I was meant to be meeting the CEO for my final interview. He was busy talking to investors or something. He didn't have time. Um, he was going to be a bit late. So they put me in a room and then just asked someone to come and keep, talk mm. to me to keep me busy, basically. And I felt bad. And it just happened to be this lady who, um, she, she kind of had, you know, it was, it was kind of, kind of relevant. She was our head of operations and scaling. Mm. Um, and she's worked, I think, three different startups now through um, like exiting. And she is effectively our kind of CEO now, really. Mm. That's the role that she has here. And uh, we, we, she was very intelligent. And in the interview process, I said, but if, when I got told I was successful, I asked if she could be my mentor. Oh, nice. So then first day on the job, I went over and I said, I heard you could be my mentor, fantastic. <laughs> and then ever since we've been meeting up fortnightly and cause she comes from this like very operations heavy mm -hmm. um, aspect and she just looks, she just approaches things so differently to how I do. So um, it can generally just whatever I've got come up that week or if I'm you know, putting together a strategy or I'm even thinking like how big the team needs to be mm -hmm. or anything like that I maybe not even think is relevant for her. She generally has a quite different perspective on it mm -hmm. and kind of very much encourages me to take a step back and think about things differently and think about it from a, a bigger picture standpoint. Because mm -hmm. um, I think probably because of my probably my experience in my career, I often get quite in the details. Right. It's, a, it's a good practice to try and take a step back and not do Should that. Should I give her a shout out on the website? Yeah, Emily Bremner, she's called. She's amazing. And, and, mm. where, and where do you think you'll be in the business in nine months? So you've been in the business now nine months, mm. about nine months more. What's, you know? Well, I think um, America's hopefully going to really take off. So yeah. I'm going to be spending quite a lot of time over there um, in, the, in the coming months. So. Yeah, head of hopefully head of sales up still, and uh, probably with a bigger team, I would imagine. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think I think that will happen. Mm -hmm. Any more questions? That's it. That's it. Um, cool. But how? Yeah, yeah we're good. Um, okay.
Well, Kirsty, thank you. Thank yeah, you. I like so much. No, so it's... each one of these, I get like one like golden thing, and this okay. was the monthly review and forecast accuracy. Mm. We don't do that, do we? No, I think uh, as Jay was talking last night, we don't do much forecasting because we're not quite um, at that stage yet. Mm. That, that, you know, there is a perfect time to do it. Um, so yeah, I think, but I think using the rag is something mm -hmm. we can mm -hmm. probably start doing mm -hmm. so we can start to forecast nice with some accuracy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's really good sweet let's know how it goes yeah yeah absolutely. <laughs> right, we'll talk about it on the web <laughs> uh, cool so we will be back we had to do this on wednesday because i'm actually away tomorrow but we'll be back on thursday next week 5 p.m thank you very much for watching thanks guys